How's everyone doing? Everyone good? Everyone tired? It's been a long week getting ready for work again tomorrow. I know I am. A um, whole bunch of announcements to get through this morning, so I'm not going to cover them all, but I will kind of refer you to the bulletins um, to cover a couple of um, uh, quick things that we'll want to go through. But um, welcome everybody online. Um, thank you for joining us. It's, a, it's our pleasure that you were with us today. And uh, welcome to everyone that's here today. Thank you for, for coming this morning. And I know it's a little bit harder to get up um, as the weather gets colder, right? You can feel that it's coming. And we've just had this nice warm weather and then it shifts over to this cold stuff. And sometimes I still wonder why I live in New England. But, um, in your chairs, there's connect cards. Um, so please take those out. If you have a prayer request, write out that prayer request um, and you can drop it in uh, one of the offering uh, boxes on the way out. Um, and that way we can be praying for you. Or if you just want to get signed up for any of our um, announcements and, and email chain, then put your email address on there. We'll, we'll be getting that information out to you as well. Um, giving, um, several ways to give. You can give online. Um, you can write a check and drop it on the offering boxes, or you can also um, give by texting now and the instructions on how to do that are in your bulletin. And we just uh, truly blessed and, and thankful um, for all the givers we have here. And if you're visiting with us, please do not feel any obligation to give. Um, we are supported by our members and regular attendees. So um, we're just happy that you're with us today. So a few announcements, things that I'll point you to is the... Children's Christmas Choir, so please take a look at that, and, and um, you can see Dave or Brittany, um, if you have more information about that, and then Reeves Across America. This is a pretty cool thing. I would ask that you read through this, and then if you'd like to take part of that, then um, just go ahead and um, you can follow the link on there for Reeves Across America. Um, and then some housekeeping items. This Tuesday, um, the 21st at um, 6.30, We'll be having an annual Thanksgiving worship service. So um, if you are available, we'd love to have you. It's a, a great informal um, worship service that we'll be having, and um, we'd love to have you if you can attend that. Um, and then on Saturday, December 2nd at 3 p.m., we're going to be having a church business meeting um, followed by um, a Christmas dinner afterwards. So um Members are, are um, asked to attend if you are able. Um, there's some um, voting that needs to happen, and we need um, you know members there to be able to vote. Um, but everyone is welcome. Uh, if you want to see what's going on in the church and um, hear about what we're doing um, and what items um, need to be voted upon, um, and then just stay for dinner, we'd love to have you for that as well. Um, Wednesday nights, um, activities. There will be no activities this Wednesday. Um, due to Thanksgiving week and everyone getting ready for that. So um, everyone can have this Wednesday off. And then there's some couple of big help wanted items. Um, so Cheryl needs still needs help in the, the nursery um, and she needs one more person. So um, if someone could step up and help out in that area, that'd be wonderful if you're gifted with the children. And then um, the SWAT team, um, which is my team that hands out the bulletins and stuff in the morning. If you could help us out there, we could really use help. Qualifications for that are really difficult. If you come here on Sunday mornings, you're qualified. So um, please let us know if, um, if you can um, help out in that area and that would just kind of um, lengthen the rotation for everybody. So um, if you have any questions or anything, just please see me on that. Let's go to prayer. <clears throat> <clears throat> Father God, in this season of Thanksgiving, the thing that we are most thankful for is your love and your protection and your plan of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we are humbled by the fact that when you look to us um, to serve you, you don't care how much money we have. You don't care how we dress. You don't care about our speech and how eloquent it might be or may not be. You don't care about the things we've done in our past. 
You only care about our hearts, Lord. And when our hearts are right and are aligned with yours, we ask that you just show us our sins, that we may begin to hate them as, as you hate them, Lord, so that we may be used for your glory. Lord, you may use us in great and small ways alike, and we're just so blessed um, that you want to work through us in this way, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we love you. We ask that you be with Pastor Steve as he brings us the message this morning, um, that his words will be of you, and that you may uh, stir our hearts, Lord, to, uh, to bring us closer to you. May our songs of praise be pleasing, Lord, and that... Um, we may come to you with open, open hearts that you might um, move us and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Would you please join and, st and stand, sorry, stand and join with us in worship this morning. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. Come, let us worship our King.
mundo When I an awesome wonder consider all the worlds that hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder that power throughout the universe is free. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great thou art. And when I think that God is so not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing. He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior, God. But 
the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other thoughts I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other vows I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other faults I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. the highs what wealth of me I was lost but he brought me oh his love for me oh his love for me who oh, the sun sets free oh it's free I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free last he has ransomed, his grace runs deep. While I was asleep to sin, Jesus died for Yes, he died for me through the sunset spring. Oh, it's free and deep. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for. Child of God, yes I am. I am chosen. I am chosen. Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Through the sun sets free, oh, it's free and deep. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. 
In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, God, you have made us children of yours. And Jesus, you said that you are going to prepare a place for us. And God, we are so grateful for that. We're so grateful. Jesus, that you gave your life on the cross, but now you are in heaven. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. And because of that, you have all rule and reign and authority in heaven and on earth. And God, we are so blessed by that. God, we pray that today would glory, would bring you glory and honor you. And God, we can only do that because you gave us your Holy Spirit. And it's through your son, Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. my honor to lead you in the Lord's Supper this week. Um, the deacons who are going to serve the elements, if they could move a little closer to us, which is a little more challenging the more we grow, finding seats, right? It's always a bit difficult to put into words um, from this side of uh, the Lord's table to balance the tension that is revealed in Scripture about the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, on one hand, we come to mourn the death of our Lord and Savior. Um, we come to mourn the sin in our lives that caused him to be hung on that cross. Our own disobedience and rebellion. But on the other hand, we celebrate the love of God that was so strong. He sent his son there in full knowledge that that was going to happen. To celebrate the freedom from sin and its grip on our life and, and the freedom from the punishment, which is God's wrath on that sin. And to celebrate that freedom. But to mourn. At the same time, it seems like only um, somebody with multiple personalities could be able to do that. But we're asked to do it in the way that we're also asked to believe that, 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 that Jesus was both man and God. That, that the Bible was written by both God and man. Right? So there's a lot of things like that in our faith that we, that we also have this tension within us about. So how do we navigate this ceremony, right? In, in, in grief or in celebration, in intimacy with our greatest friend or in awe and wonder over the creator and sustainer of all things? And the answer is yes, and both. Um, that's... That's the only way. And, um, you know, if you look at the original account, okay, in, in, in the Gospels, in, in, in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22, the occasion, right? It wasn't a formal celebration, right? Jesus, it says, he reclined among them, right? He sat at a low table with a friendly dinner with his best friends he'd been with for three years and gently explained to them he's going to give his life for them and for all who would follow. And they celebrated the occasion. Okay? And this is where it really starts to come home for us in the church. 
the occasion, the Passover, God's deliverance of his people from slavery, in which they were marked by the blood of a sacrifice. Right? And he had told them to mark the, the post of their doors so the angel of death would fly over and spare them. And that's what he was celebrating that night, and that's what he was foretelling for the church. Because we have accepted his blood, his sacrifice, so that we're spared. And how did they celebrate it that night? Okay, this is important for us to know as well. I know some, some say Messianic Jews, you know, they, they, they follow these holidays. And I'm not saying that's wrong whatsoever. But what's important for us to remember is that Jesus observed that holiday just as God prescribed. Right? And that's what we should be doing as well. Okay? That's what kind of gets us into the other aspect of it, this, um, the transcendence. Because when we see the um, Lord's Supper being observed in the epistles, we see not the intimacy of a celebratory dinner with best friends. What do we see? We see that somberness. We see that transcendence. We see the, the seriousness of it. All right? Let me read a little bit from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and the drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So that's a little bit different of, a, uh, of an atmosphere that's being created here than, than what we saw at the original event. But that's, that's that tension, you know, the yes and both to that, to that answer. So, you know, as we celebrate this, we do see the intimacy of our Lord and Savior standing before us, giving his life for us. But we also see the serious side of that celebration where we search our hearts for the sin that placed Christ on that cross. Gone is the intimacy or that friendly conversation over dinner with our friend and our teacher. And we're thrust into the presence of God who sees our heart, right, where, where that sin lurks. So as the deacons pass out the elements, please take this time to, to search yourselves, examine yourselves, as Paul says. And, and get right with God by both celebrating and mourning, right? By, by both joyful praise and remorseful repentance in the fact that our friend, our Savior, gave his life for ours. And that through that, we can enjoy the love of God. So would the deacons please? Oh, burn first.
I'd like to ask our uh, deacon, Steve Jackson, to please bless the bread. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we come here today reminded of um, the series that's the disciples of what you did for us. And I think of the time when you were feeding the 5,000 and then took the bread and prayed over it and broke it. It's a reminder that you had to be broken in order to accomplish the mission to redeem us, the mission to make the way back to the And Lord, we thank you for that. Help us, oh God, to realize and never underestimate the brokenness you endured that we could experience freedom, be covered with your blood, and made righteous by everything you have been and done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Sorry, I didn't feed you guys, did I? Left somebody out. If 
you would lead us in prayer again, please, Steve. Let's pray for the cup. Father, I don't know why this chamber is in my head right now, but I think of the old song that says, put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. And we think of that gentle servant who came into town that day to redeem us. When you said, let us create man in our image, and then to become a man to pay that price so that we could be redeemed, truly, Lord, it is a celebration. We thank you, Lord, that we have been set free by your shed blood. We thank you, Lord, for this new covenant in which we can be saved by Jesus Christ and all that he has done. Let us rejoice. Let us all be a real wet candle in the darkness of this world because of what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, he said, this is the cup that is poured out for you and it is the new covenant in my blood. Amen and amen. Thank you, um, Diaconate, for, for serving in, in such a great way. I have a couple things that um, I want to add on to what Derek presented this morning, and I, I want to I just start that out um, so the Kids Church teachers um, don't miss out on it either. Um, great time here last night. Uh, thank you all that helped out, but Brianna and Landon were married, and they're off to parts unknown. And um, if you had seen this place 12 hours ago, you would not have recognized it. And um, just so you know, everybody here heard the gospel. So that's what happens when they, when they come in. Um, the business meeting that's scheduled for the second... Um, above and beyond our bylaws, you will all be read. Uh, you all be getting a, or members will be getting a um, summary of our um, financial budget for 2024. It'll be coming, it may be even be in your inbox when you get home. I don't, I'm not sure exactly when it's coming, but it's, it's done and it's, and it's on its way out. And if you have any questions or concerns or comments about anything, please um, come and, and, and talk to me or one of the elders because it's not in everybody's um, comfort zone to stand up at a business meeting and ask questions. So um, you'll get that way ahead of time. Uh, we also have a opportunity to uh, serve the pastors in India with that clothing drive for their pastors again this year. You'll be hearing some more information about it on an email this week, but I think over the next couple of weeks, we'll be taking a collection to be able to um, get them new clothes. Uh, ministry leaders, uh, I'm going to be making a time to speak with each and one of you uh, before we get to the end of the year, just to get caught up, see how things are going. So when I corny you, don't freak out. Um, I'm going to talk to all of them. Uh, it's just what we do. And um, I have a 24-pound turkey in the oven right now for our small group uh, and no vegetables. So if, what's that? Yeah, that doesn't count. Um, <laughs> So we're going to start talking about being an ambassador for God's kingdom. What is an ambassador? What is the kingdom? How does this all work? So um, over Turkey, we'll be discussing that. The address and the time is in your bulletin. We'd love to have uh, new people. It's also a great first step for somebody maybe not ready to come in here on a Sunday morning. So, uh, oh, and uh, Tuesday night. Um, give me a break, will you? Um, literally. Uh, I'm going to be asking you guys if you can actually stand up and give a reason why you're thankful to God. So think about that for a few days, and we'll all have a chance to um, give a, uh, a thankful 
prayer to God, just a word of thanks to God, maybe read a scripture verse or whatever you'd like. But the, but the, the sanctuary is going to be set up a little bit different and, and it's going to be much of a different feel, very informal, no live stream, just, just kind of a family gathering. So I'm really looking forward to that. But I'm counting on you to bring something with you to, um, to say what you're thankful for. So, um, and, and being baptized. We got baptisms coming up. You know, I've been talking about baptism for six months. Nobody says a word. All of a sudden, I get five people want to get baptized. But that's not enough. We need more. So if you're interested, let me know. Because within a couple of weeks, we're going to have a, a ceremony here. Um, it's going to be great. So, um, I mean, in the, in the book of Acts, they believed and they were baptized. Believed and they were baptized. So if you want to publicly proclaim your faith, uh, let me know. And we'll do it. And it'll make me chop a hole in the ice again. Um, I'm going to... Do something with our little tub there. So um, I think that's all I needed to say. So at this time, the children are dismissed with their teachers. And we'll get them off to children's church. You know that at some point, the plan is to um, have the children's church um material match ours. Um, we've been working towards that, but I, we just haven't found a good curriculum to be able to do that yet. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to having their lessons match our sermons so they can embarrass you on the ride home and all they know. Uh, but that, 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 that's the goal, and we're working towards that, but uh, we haven't quite, haven't quite reached it yet. So if the rest of you would join me in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 29, right where we left off last week. It's actually our last um, week in 1 Samuel. It's another good stopping off point. We're going to uh, begin next week, our Advent season, at kind of an interesting take on the Advent season, but I'll, I'll, I'll email that out to you tomorrow. Um, now we're going to tackle uh, the end of Saul and the beginning of God's choice for king. And, and as I read these verses this week, and I try to understand how it would apply to our lives. I was thinking of a time in my life many, many years ago. I spent the summer as a lifeguard at a summer camp, and there was lots of lifeguards. And the lifeguards just didn't stand there in the big chair watching, making sure people didn't sink. Um, the lifeguards had a lot of duties. We had uh, to teach canoeing and teach sailing and teach rowing and the polar bear club. There was lots of stuff for lifeguards to do. But the one thing that none of the lifeguards would volunteer for were si swimming lessons for the, the kids with uh, Down syndrome. And um, that duty let, was left untaken by the lifeguard staff. And finally, the head of the camp said, okay, um, whoever takes that, that will be their only duty all summer, other than the lifeguarding. They didn't have to do anything else all summer long except teach this class. And I was like, I'm in, because um, I was all about fishing, and it would leave more time for fishing. I would like to say I did it out of the goodness of my heart, but that wasn't my motivation at the moment. Um, it turned out to be awesome. I had so much fun with those kids. Uh, it was great. On the flip side, what it didn't do for me was teach me anything whatsoever about sailing. Um, and at the end of the, uh, the summer, they had this great camp Olympics, and they had six teams, and at the water events, each team was led by a lifeguard, and um, I had to sail. I'd never even been in a sailboat. So um, I grabbed the lightest kid, I could find, and we jumped in the sailboat, and the starter pistol went off, and um, because of our light weight, we were way out front, and we had to sail around these three buoys at three corners of this lake, and it was a mile, two mile, it was a long ways, and we were hauling, and, um, but I noticed as we got to that first buoy, we were heading right for the buoy, and, and I looked, and all the other boats weren't behind me. They were way over on the side of me, behind me. But I just figured I knew something they didn't. But it was really the other way around. Because when we hit that buoy, buoy and I 
whatever that thing's called that you steer it with. Um, when I did that, we got halfway around the corner and then the whole boat flipped right over. And um, it, the wind was blowing so strong, it pushed the bottom of the boat. So it drove the mast down to the mud at the bottom of the pond. And then the motorboat, the ski boat picked us up. But a good part of that afternoon was spent on the motorboat trying to yank the mast out of the mud. Um, and even at, by the that next week that ended the camp, I was spent a lot of my time trying to fix that boat and scrub that ooze off the top of that mast. Um, so what really happened there was I learned that lesson that even though I desired to do something, I had no business doing it. I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't gifted for it. I wasn't called to that place. I put myself in it for my own purposes. And that created all kinds of problems for myself and all kinds of other people. And it caused me to have to scrub that boat and, and fix it for the rest of the week. And, and that's really kind of what we're looking at here today is it, it, how do we understand how God calls us to serve him? And how do we know when he's not calling us to serve him? And one thing that I pray that you will understand from these verses. Oh, it's already up there. That God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And so far, just to, to sum up what we've looked at already in the, in the last few weeks, God has answered his people's demand for a king. Even though he wasn't ready to give them one, they were demanding a king. So he gave it to them. Not as an answer to their prayers, but, but as a judgment on their disobedience. Right? And the guy's name is Saul. He quickly disobeys two direct commands of God through the prophet Samuel. And God removes him, right? You're fired. The Lord has tore the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. So before we roll on through this, I want to just make sure we're placing it in the proper context. Um, Sometimes we open up, especially in the Old Testament, we open up a, a narrative, right, in the, in the middle of God's redemptive history. And we have a habit of isolating it from the greater picture. And we, we can never do that because it always has a place in the greater story. But what is the greater story? What's the overriding theme of the entire Bible? Right? If I was going to ask you, what would you say? Right? Well, well, in my opinion, my Old Testament professor at the, at the, at the moment it has a little bit different take on it. But, but I believe it's God's reaching out into his creation with an invitation for people to know him, to be with him. Right? He speaks to the people made in his image in order that they would come to a right relationship with him. That's how I see the entire story of the Bible. It's its purpose, its theme. So everything in the Bible, including our story here, plays a role in that main theme. You know, God has a chosen people, and through him, he's going to bring a Savior who will cleanse them of their sins so that they can be in union with him. God has chosen a tribe from him to be descended from, right? Judah, a family to be born into, right? The line of David, who would eventually be called by God. That's the neighbor that we're just talking about in that last verse, to be their earthly king. But the people wouldn't wait, right? They demanded the king. And they got Saul as a judgment for the rebellion and immediately disobeyed him, right? And I only mention this because it's only through Judah, the line of Judah, it's only through the family line of David that Jesus will be born. And it's only through Jesus that all people who repent and believe will be saved and enter God's kingdom. All right? So, so this narrative is just not a cute little story. It's part of that. Right? It's the gospel that's at stake here. Not just whether a king or a people are going to obey or not obey. It's about whether they're going to be part of God's plan to redeem people through the life and the work of Jesus Christ, or they're just going to sit idly by and watch God march on through using other people. He's calling his people, including us, to take part. And we need to hear the call and respond in faith. But we don't just hear that call. We hear all kinds of calls from around us. And which ones we answer are going to dictate how effectively we're able to serve him in that main theme of the Bible. And the first principle we see emerge here, 
Oh, wait, I got those in the wrong order, don't I? As God desires his children to take part. That won't be the first mistake on this slide, I'll guarantee you. God desires his children to take part in his providential plan to save sinners. So he replaces the disobedient with the obedient to serve him. Right? So, so God fires Saul through Samuel. And in vivid fashion, Samuel takes care of business. Right? Verse 29. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man, and that he should not have regret. And this is Saul speaking, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me. He's talking to Samuel, I'm sorry, uh, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. And Samuel said, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death has passed. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And if you're new here this week, we again, we've repeated two main issues that sometimes cloud people's vision of the purpose of this narrative. And that has to do with God regretting, and it also has with God telling, a loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God telling his children to hack people to pieces. And if... Um, that is troublesome to you, I would ask you first to go back and listen to my sermon from last week where I, I spent a good deal of time um, talking about this. And if you still have um, some issues with it, please let me know and we could sit and chat about it. But it is not out of his nature whatsoever. Um, what we really need to see here is that God's plan is not going to be ruined by a person's disobedience. God's not in need in any way. God wants Agag gone. Saul won't do it. He finds somebody that will. Samuel's more than happy to. You know, the, the stuff that Saul did on its face value in a vacuum wasn't bad, right? Sacrifices are good. He could rationalize that. He marched with, with the army and, and took on the Amalekites in battle. Good stuff, right? But in both, he absolutely directly disobeyed God, no matter how you rationalize it. Both had to be done according to God's command, and they weren't, right? He heard God, he knew what he was supposed to do, and he did just enough so people around him would think that he was doing the godly thing. But he wasn't. He was following his own proudly, uh, uh, prideful desires, and the principle shouldn't be lost on us as well in the church, right? If you're not obeying God in how ministry, serving God and serving others in his name, ministry. If you're not obeying God in that, then, then don't plan on it lasting very long. It's as simple as that. Like the famous comedian talked about when his mother got really, really mad, she'd yell at him, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. Right? God can do that, and he will do that. And maybe you would say, and I get this all the time, well, what about that huge church? It's got all those people. They have all that money and all that opportunity. What about that, that church? That church in Texas. That church with 50,000 people. Why doesn't God remove that pastor? from service? And the answer is, he already has. He doesn't serve God. Someone like Joel Olstein is a judgment on rebellious people who seek to follow their own desires and not Christ. He's not serving God, he's serving himself. And the folks there are not victims. They're being judged. 
no matter, no matter how God has called you to serve, and he has, you need to live in obedience to his word, or he's just going to replace you. We, we can't think that we can comp I have real trouble with this word. Uh, compartmentalize your life. I was in the thesaurus trying to find another one, but that's the only one that worked. Um, you can't do that. You can't live in disobedience over here and then show up to serve God over here and say, oh, I'm ready. And we're going to see why in a little while. When you answer God's call to serve him, you're also answering his call to obedience. They work together. So let's take a look and see how that happens. The first five verses of chapter 16, where God desires his children to take part in his providential plan to save sinners, so he seeks those called to serve him. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, Jesse of the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite. And I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what to do. And you will anoint and you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. And Samuel did what Lord command, the Lord commanded and, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came to meet him trembling. They say, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So Samuel's a little concerned about Saul. Because he's already told him twice he's fired, so he's really not sure, you know, what, what, what his reaction to that is going to be. Um, and I think, you know, by looking at the character of Saul, he's pretty concerned about Samuel as well. So there's some distrust there. There's a little power struggle going on. And the elders of Bethlehem, um, they don't want to get caught up in the middle of it. All right? They're afraid of both. Uh, Bethlehem's only, when you see Bethlehem being called um, Jerusalem, it's a suburb. It's very close. It's just a few miles outside. So, so don't, uh, don't think that's a contradiction. Um, but they don't want to get caught up in this power struggle. So he reassures them it's peaceful. Um, invite Jesse's family. We're going to have this sacrifice to the Lord. It's a, a cleansing ceremony, right? It's going to represent um, the ceremony itself would represent a, a clean heart and that special clothes they were going to put on, which is part of the concentration, consecration, would represent the clean outward actions, so, like, you know, a lot of things in the, in the Jewish faith, uh, symbolism runs really deep here. I, I think it's explained in Exodus 19, um, does a pretty good job of explaining that consecration uh, ceremony. So when God calls people, he seeks them. You know, we have a prophet, you know, doing God's seeking here. I'm not saying that wouldn't happen now, but, but I would say it's not God's preferred method now. Um, unlike the time we're reading about here, now every one of God's people has the Holy Spirit living within them to guide them and minister to them, to convict them, um, and, and to do the work more often than you would um, see a, a, a prophet coming today. So the difference between the, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant as it applies to this principle. Um, but, but how that actually looks today is going to be different, as different as we are, as different as our gifts are. So there's no real way for me to, you know, point that out to you exactly. But one thing that will remain the same in all of us is that it, he's going to give us spiritual gifts through the Holy Spirit, and then he gives us opportunities to use them. That's all there is to ministry. That's it. Two steps. Voila. If how you think God is calling you to serve seems complicated or complex in any way, if it's confusing you, 
you, you've probably taken a wrong turn somewhere. Um, or maybe you're just running out in front of God. You know, you're, 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 you're getting ahead of him. Maybe, maybe you're chasing, it could be maybe you're chasing your own desires and you're on the wrong track. Um, maybe you're not consecrated. Maybe there's some sin in your life that, that needs to be dealt with first. Maybe you need time to prepare. Right? Maybe you have a long, maybe he's called you, but you have a long road ahead of you before you're practically suited for it. That's what, that, that's what happened to me. I was called to ministry. I was absolutely positive of it. But it was five years between calling and actually serving. It took that long. I was, thought I was ready on the first day. You know how I get. But um, that wasn't the case. You know, and, and it's not me, right? The apostles, like three years in Jesus, you, Paul spent his youth, you know, trained under the greatest Pharisee for five or six years at least, we would imagine. Then it says in Galatians that, uh, that he went to Arabia, taught by Christ himself. Timothy, Barnabas, Silas, taught by Paul. Tim, I mean, it goes on and on and on. So that could be, you know, we have to accept that as, as possibly, you know, um, how our calling is going to look. What's not going to look like is somebody calling themselves to ministry. I've never seen such carnage in a church before in my life as when people call themselves to ministries. And I'm not just talking about pastors or elders, any kind of service. And I don't know if there's a harder duty in a pastor's calling than try to explain to someone that they're not actually serving according to their gift. But you have to do it or else they're never going to find their place. It's God that places the calling on a person's life, right? Before the foundation of the word, of the world, right? We, we see that um, as examples in the life of Jeremiah and the, and, the, and the life of Paul. And I believe that is on your scripture references to this point. Um, you know, he has a calling for you. If you want to serve God, you have to truly serve him in that capacity, not yourself. It means surrendering to his will, not your own. It means glorifying him and not yourself. And, and you can follow the theology on this, too. If, if you want, follow me here, right? The Holy Spirit indwells all believers at time of conversion, um, Ephesians 1, 13, I think. Um, and the Holy Spirit inside of you, right? Um, Never testifies to himself, but points only to Christ, John 15, 26. Um, he's also the distributor of spiritual gifts from God. What are those gifts for? They're for the common good, for building up of the church, not becoming le grand fromage, right? It's not to be the big cheese, um, 1 Corinthians 12, right? It's for the common good, the building up of the church. I mean, that, that's the progression, It's also the red flags, you know, when, 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 when you start to see people who believe they're called, but their spiritual gifts only glorify themselves. You'd have to go, hmm, now if the Holy Spirit only points to Christ and spiritual gifts are for the building up of the good, how, how's that working? It's important to know. That's the groove we need to get in, right? Building up the body. So how has God gifted you? Right? What, 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 what has momentum in your life? What just happens without hardly trying? And then how has he given you opportunities to exercise those gifts for the common good, for the common good, for the church, for the universal church, not, not just here, it could be anywhere. Right? The intersection of how you're gifted and the opportunities he gives you will lead you to your calling. But we need to be careful because that pride, that monster pride is lurking around every corner trying to get us to glorify ourselves. But to make sure we stay on track, right? God desires his children to take part in his providential plan to save sinners, so he examines our hearts. Verse 6. And when they came, he looked on Ilab and thought, surely God's anointed is before him. 
But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not, uh, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither the Lord has chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Now, appearances can be deceiving. The outward appearances don't reveal what God wants to see. Moral and spiritual considerations, right? They're not really worn out on our outward appearance. And they're much more important to God. That's why I say God looks at our heart, right? Our spiritual condition, our, our flexibility to his rule over our lives, our, our, our humility and our love for him, right? Proverbs 4.3 says that everything we do flows from our heart. And Jesus taught that a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings out evil things that from the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, right? Luke 6, 45. Right? And, and I, it's also important for us to understand, as far as we can tell, there's nothing wrong with those brothers, right? This isn't a good guys and bad guys thing that we can tell, but it is a good choice and a bad choice for a king. So it's just a matter of calling. It's just that things are not as, as they appear. Right? Our hearts are, are in the inside of us, and they can be, be obscured by things like intellect and beauty and strength. Right? I don't know how many times I've gone to look at old cars that are so polished up and nice, but you take a little magnet, you know, and you, and you, and you try to stick it to the side, and it falls right off because the bondo on the side of the car is an inch and a half thick. Right? Rotten in there. You can't tell sometimes because that paint is so shiny. And it's the same with us. I, I, I'll i mess up his name, but boy, have you seen um, Nick Vuich Itch? Right? It's the evangelist that's uh, no arms and legs. Amazing. Amazing. But, you you know, the world wouldn't wouldn't give him a second look. Or, or, or I love the testimony from uh, David Ring. Um, has been going uh, around to churches, giving his testimony for 40 years. He has cerebral palsy. Amazing testimony. He communicates, it's real difficult communicating with cerebral palsy, but how he communicates with that condition makes his testimony even better. It's, it's amazing. It's on YouTube, uh, David Ring. The, the Apostle Paul, right? I, I mean, some physical descriptions of him from extra biblical had him short and bow legged with a unibrow. And I mean, there's a pretty good description of him in some different places. And he, he wasn't Tom Selleck. I'll tell you that much. Same with Moses. And, and, you know, Matthew was a traitor to his own people, right? Collecting taxes for the Romans, Simon, the zealot blind to everything, but political realities. Things aren't normally how they appear. And you want to take that principle and place it in the context of God's plan to save sinners by the power of the gospel. Um, I'll share a couple of verses with you from 1 Corinthians 1, which is, I mean, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 are a couple of my favorite chapters, but uh, 1, 26 through 30. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let no one who boasts, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Kind of encouraging, isn't it? How freeing is it? 
to know that it, God sees the real us and that we don't need to measure up to the world's standards in order to serve him. Isn't that awesome or what? It's like, God sees my heart. Yay. Wait, God sees my heart? Oh, no. All right? There's nothing hidden from God. And what is truly in your heart is what he sees. And what he truly sees is what will bring you into his service or excuse you from it. And we just need to be open and honest with him about our struggles that we have and bring our burdens to him and surrender and repentance. We don't have to be perfect or even close to it. God looks right through all the things that the world holds dear, right? Money and status and strength and education and beauty and ethnicity. He looks right to the heart, the inner person from which all thoughts, words, deeds, everything we are emanate. And when he sees a heart devoted to him, he's going to use it in a mighty way. Does your, does your outline have a fourth point? I got a fourth point. Told you that wasn't the only problem. Do I have a fourth slide? That would be something, wouldn't it? God calls who he has chosen to serve him. Um, in verse 11 through 13, I just wanted to finish that out with those four verses. And then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? There remains yet the youngest, but hold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send me out and get him. for We won't sit down until he comes. And he sent him and brought him in. He was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and he was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up. And went to Rama. Rama's where his home was. I apologize about messing up that uh, that outline. But God desires His children to take part in His providential plan to save sinners. So He calls who He has chosen to serve Him. Right? I mean, they didn't even invite Him. Right? His own father. Get all your sons. And he doesn't even think to bring them. You know, the, 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 not just that, but th that he was out keeping sheep. That was a lot of times um, a duty for um, slaves or social outcasts. Or, or Not always, but it was a good job for him. Kept him outside of the everyday business. But he was God's choice for king because he obeyed. Because God sought him. Because of what was in his heart. I mean, if you read forward, and, and a lot of us have heard, read forward different times in our lives and seen what was in store for David as king, before king, it wasn't going to be easy, was it? No. But would it fulfill God's plan to save sinners through Jesus Christ? Yes. That's what we need to see here, you know, David was called to serve God and he was qualified. So that calling became a reality. Well, you know, we don't have kings in the church. We can experience this, this same concept. I hope and pray each one of you will experience the calling in your lives to a specific ministry or, or act of service. There's nothing more fulfilling than the knowledge of, of absolutely knowing without a doubt you are where God wants you, doing what God wants you to do. There's nothing like it. Not a perfect way. We can't go six minutes without sinning. Right? We constantly have this eternal battle going on where our flesh wants what it wants, and the world has all these temptations out there for us, and we, 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 we see and hear and feel, and of course, you know, all of those temptations, and the enemy will use both of these things to try to um, for the best of his advantage to get us off track of where he wants us. But when, when you're called and you obey and you answer to it and, 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 you, and, you, and you dedicate yourself to that ministry that he's called you to, there is nothing like it. 
I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a teaser here. We're going to double back on this uh, on December 3rd. So in a couple of weeks, mark that on your calendar. So um, we're going to go back to this and talk a little bit more about it. I'm kind of excited about it. But all in all, the challenge of these verses is that, you know, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. You know, you can sound convincing and, and maybe others believe you and maybe they even applaud you for it and maybe it even goes good for a little while. Doesn't mean God is calling you to serve in that way. When God calls you, he's going to seek you, right? You don't call yourself. When he calls you, he's going to search your heart. So consecrate yourself for service. So you're not limiting your capacity to serve him. And when God calls you, it means he's chosen you. And this should be both the most fulfilling yet humbling part of your spiritual life. So I, I, I mean, so I just got to ask, really, I mean, how is this process playing out in your life right now? Where in the outline are you? We're all someplace on it, you know? Do you have any questions about it? Come and talk to me about it. Come to talk to one of the elders about it. You know, we have a help wanted list in the, in the foyer. Don't get confused with that. that. That's just ways to plug in. That, that's just us giving you opportunities to maybe use your gifts. Your gifts could be anything. And this church could be as big as the whole world. I know we just sent a couple people to Thailand, right? He could be calling you to just about anything. So just be sure you're answering his call and not your own, so you don't end up with a muddy mast. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this body. Just pray that you would be with us as we seek to understand your calling on our lives. Lord, make it plain. Give us a boot if we need it. Give us courage to step outside of our comfort zone and, and serve you the way you want us to. Lord, I just pray that as we enter into this season of, of celebration for the gift that was your son with us, we would see the opportunities to serve the community outside these walls as well. I thank you for all this time, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this time, I would like to um, invite our elder, Don Beelan, um, and the worship team to close out our service with a pastoral prayer and a final worship song. Good morning, Hope in Christ Church. I'd like to read to you a, a verse from Romans 12.12. 12. It says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, devoted in prayer. With that, let's uh, bow and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord. So your love is just so great for us, Lord. It just uh, surpasses our understanding, Lord, how much you love us and uh, your forgiveness and you put up with our failed uh, attempts, Lord, to, to just to please you, Lord, in, in our lives, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for that, Lord. And, and Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for our salvation. How much it costs, Lord, for us to um, be able to spend eternity with you, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, your word says that nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. But Lord, we just we praise you so much, Lord, for sending your son, Lord, and that his sacrifice, that his blood will cover our sins, Lord. And we thank you for that. Lord, I declare us. Please declare us innocent, Lord, from our hidden faults. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all those here who, uh, who contribute to uh, serving you here, Lord, and to um, keeping this, uh, this church going, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for those who contributed to 
all the Thanksgiving baskets, Lord, in, 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 in food or the money or in their time, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for all those that serve you here as well, Lord, at Hope in Christ Church and, and in our community as well, Lord. There are many here that serve you, Lord, and uh, we just praise you for that, Lord. And Lord, we know that uh, we have uh, many requests, Lord, for, for healings, Lord, and I, I ask you, Lord, that you would be with each situation there on our prayer list, Lord, that you would um, uh, be with each one, Lord. I pray that you would give them peace, Lord, and understanding, Lord, and that uh, uh, also that we would, uh, we would trust you, Lord, uh, with your healing hand. And I also pray, Lord, for those here that uh, do not know you yet, Lord. I pray, Lord, for their salvation, Lord, and that you would... Um, you would give us all this the wisdom, Lord, to um, to seek them out, Lord, and to help them and to guide them, Lord, into your into your kingdom. Pray for those, Lord, that have been newly baptized and newly accepted the Lord, and help us to uh, to strengthen them, Lord. To, to pray that you keep them in fellowship and that uh, you would keep the uh, evil evil ones away from them, Lord, and that uh, they could uh, truly grow as Christians, Lord. Lord, I ask you for this church as well, Lord, that you would bless us with godly leaders, Lord. I pray that um, you would strengthen our faith, Lord. Help us, Lord, with uh, with our walk with you, Lord, that uh, we will not falter, Lord, but we would truly really bring glory and honor to you. Guide us by your spirit, Lord. And I ask you, Lord, show us to, to love and support each other, Lord, and to serve each other, Lord. Uh, just teach us those ways, Lord, that we may be a a strong and healthy church here. And uh, teach us how to lift each other up as well, Lord. And that, uh, even though we're different, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that you would give us the, the love and understanding, Lord, and uh, patience to work well with each other. We just thank you and praise you, Lord, for being such a loving God, Lord, and for uh, teaching us and molding us in your ways. And, Keep us to focus on your ways and not the world. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for how much you love us, Lord, and for your grace and mercy as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and just enter our final song? <clears throat> it occurred to me, um, we usually share scriptures that coincide with the songs. I try to um, throughout the service. And... Uh, this last one doesn't usually have a scripture because Pastor Steve reads the benediction at the end. So I just wanted to include this today. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And it continues on in, in verse 38. It says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I just wanted you to be encouraged by that today, that there's nothing in this world that can separate you from the love of God. Please be blessed.
into the darkness we shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power, our God, our God. God is for us. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? What can stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Then what can stand You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing with many thanksgivings to God. God bless you all, and have a great week. Hey, Brenda. Excellent. I shouldn't be talking to you on the microphone.